be found that something uh, in the scholarship on your ethics. So uh, the topic which he has chosen also is a topic of general interest to us as Indians because there is a certain government in our center which we understand it has a strong ideology towards a certain side and uh, their credentials as a totally law abiding government is something that we all question our own way to certain extent. So this is a question that we have uh, is also in the US where uh, our democracy is very much um, 45 minutes? Okay, all right. Well, thank you all for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, the, you know, Jindal University is, is well known in, in the United States and we've gotten to know a number of your uh, teachers and it's a real honor for me to be here. So I'm, I'm quite grateful to you for having me out to come speak uh, and to talk about something that is uh, of continuing interest to me. Um, as Professor Sethi was, was saying, I have written about the advising in the Bush administration about issues of torture and human rights and treatment of detainees. And I had hoped not to have to write about that again, but it looks like we're in a time in which I have to do this again and talk about the duties of lawyers uh, advising government officials or the government itself uh, on, on the law. And so I want to talk a little bit about ethics and you know the ethical duties here. Does my pointer work? Yeah. Um, just to say something about that, I, I know you're all law students and my students in the United States study a subject called legal ethics and it's mostly the law. It's mostly rules of professional conduct enforced by state courts and other areas of law like malpractice liability and, and lawyers call that ethics. That's not what I'm talking about today. So, so don't worry, I'm not going to talk a lot about American rules of professional conduct or anything and I don't know anything about the Indian rules of professional conduct and I'm not going to purport to teach you that. Um, that's not what I mean by ethics. What, what I mean by ethics uh, is simply critical standards of, of right and wrong. How, how do we judge when someone acts rightly or wrongly? And a lot of my work in this area has been trying to understand what lawyers do, not as part of ethics generally, uh, where, where there are moral values like loyalty and dignity that are important, but rather as part of a political system. So my work is really on the political ethics of the lawyer's role, and that's what this is really about. And so I hope that this is something that is meaningful across uh, national boundaries, and so that even though um, I, I teach the American law of lawyering and you're learning the Indian uh, principles of legal ethics, this may be something that is of interest to, to both of us. So the, the issue that I want to talk about was posed very early in the Trump administration. I'm finding it still kind of difficult to say the Trump administration. It's, it's kind of hard to believe. Um, it hasn't gotten any easier after the couple months. But so early on in the Trump administration, one of the first things that he tried to do is to uh, bring to fruition his, his vision of, uh, of nationalism, you know, make America great again, right? And one of the ways he did that was imposing this very hastily written and quite badly drafted travel ban order uh, on seven Muslim majority nations. And it was, it was rolled out without much deliberation. It was imposed overnight while people were still on airplanes. Uh, it was ridiculously overbroad. It included bans on uh, people who already had lawful permanent residents in the United States or who were dual nationals of one of these seven targeted countries in another country, uh, people who were lawfully present in the U.S. and who had just gone away to visit. And it created just enormous chaos, as you saw in the news, uh, terrible scenes, uh, families separated from their loved ones in airports, and, and it was just a, a terrible disaster. And the, the, admin, the uh, operation of the executive order was almost immediately enjoined by courts. And so I was, you know, we were joking earlier with uh, uh, Professor Kumar uh, about lawyers may actually save the world. And, and here we had a, a situation in which the courts really were doing good work. The courts quite early on intervened and issued an injunction against the travel ban order uh, for a number of reasons. We'll, we'll talk about them in, in just a minute. Um, and Currently, the first 
executive order is, is on hold, it's been permanently enjoined, and there's a revised order which is also on hold. So I'm not going to be talking about that either. This is not a talk about U.S. constitutional law, really, except insofar as it's important to get the legal background out to understand what it is that lawyers ought to do. So this uh, initial executive order uh, was, was enjoined and um, what I want to talk about is not so much the court action, but this. So this is what's interesting to me. The acting attorney general, this is somebody who had served in the Obama administration and was uh, serving in the role of attorney general, which is the government's highest legal advisor, pending confirmation of, of Trump's preferred attorney general, Jeff Sessions. Her name was Sally Yates. And when the executive order went into effect, she wrote a letter to the president and this is speaking as a lawyer on behalf of, of the government, and she basically said, I, I can't enforce this. Now, one thing I want to be clear about right up front is that just as I'm not talking about ethics in terms of the rules of conduct, I'm not really all that interested in what lawyers do in court. Now, I understand that in the popular imagination, that's what people think about when they think of lawyers. They think of lawyers appearing in court on behalf of clients, sometimes on behalf of criminal defendants, defending people they know to be guilty. This is a very uh, popular way of understanding what legal ethics is all about. I think in some ways those issues aren't as complicated because you have rules of procedure and evidence opposing lawyers and a judge to help sort things out. What I think is difficult are cases where there is no court action and a lawyer is called upon by a client, it could be a private client or it could be a government agency, to provide advice on the lawfulness of some course of action. So the president, let's say, or the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security goes to the Justice Department, which is our Ministry of Justice, our legal advisors in the, in the national government, and says, can we do this? Is this lawful? Here's a proposed order. Uh, are, are, can we implement this order? That, to me, is what's very, very interesting, because there you don't have a lawyer who says, we can try. You know, we'll make this argument in court. Maybe it'll persuade the judge, maybe not. That's kind of easy in some ways. The, the, the much harder case is where a lawyer has to say, Mr. President, yes, we can do this, no, we can't do this, and here's why. And I think in some ways that's the core of the lawyer's function, is to provide advice on the law to bring clients into compliance with the law without the necessity of some external force, like a court. So anyway, Sally Yates, the acting attorney general, basically said to the president, I can't do this. Um, and this, this letter is interesting. And she says, in litigation, lawyers for the Justice Department are charged with advancing reasonable arguments that can be made supporting an executive order. Okay, that's lawyers in court, again, something I'm less interested in. And she says, we make reasonable arguments. As long as the argument is reasonable, we can make it, we leave it for the judge, that's fine. But, she goes on to say, in addition, my responsibility is to ensure that the position of the Department of Justice is not only legally defensible, but is informed by our best view of what the law is after consideration of all the facts. So it's not enough to say this is a reasonable argument that can be made. We can make it in court. The judge isn't going to throw us out for making this argument. Rather, we have an obligation to make sure that our position is informed by the best view of the law, she said, after consideration of all the facts. In addition, she said, I'm responsible for ensuring that the positions we take in court remain consistent with this institution's solemn obligation to always seek justice and stand for what is right. Right? It's the Department of Justice, not the Department of Law. Our obligation is to always do justice and stand for what is right. At present, I'm not convinced that the defense of the executive order is consistent with these responsibilities nor am I convinced that the executive order is lawful. There's a lot going on in this letter. It's really, really interesting. She, she equivocates between reasonable arguments that can be made in court, best view of the law, obligation to do what is just, obligation to do what is lawful. These things may not all be the same, right? 
And I understand she's maybe not a scholar of jurisprudence, and she wasn't writing this to be picked apart in law school classrooms, um, but it will be forever now, so this will be studied in classrooms for years. Um, so what I found interesting is, was she right in taking this position? Is it right to say that the responsibility of a lawyer for the Department of Justice is to always do what's right? Or is it rather to advise on what is lawful? Suppose those things are different. Suppose the law permits something, but it's not just and it's not right. Which is her responsibility, right? Now, we never really got to find this out because what happened after she sent that letter? We all know Trump fired her said, I don't want someone telling me that I can't do something. So you're out of here. And so what I want to do is talk a little bit about what it would be like to be Sally Yates. So I, I always ask, ask my students to imagine themselves in the position of a lawyer who's facing this dilemma. So maybe you're not the acting attorney general. That's a big deal. That's something that happens to you at the end of your career. But perhaps you've just started, and you're working in the Ministry of Justice. You're working in the Justice Department. You're a relatively low-level legal advisor, but your boss has asked you to provide information, to provide analysis. She says, I want your research. I want you to give me a memo on what I should do. So my question to you is, is the first question you should ask yourself, what's just, what's right? She says that in here. Or is the first question you should ask yourself, what is lawful? These may be different, right? So I want to take you through a couple of slides very, very quickly, just to give you a legal background here. I don't, this is not a constitutional law class. But I want to talk a little bit about what is lawful. And again, imagine yourself as a lawyer giving this advice. And you look at the law and you th you're thinking, can the government implement this travel ban order? What can we do? Well, it turns out there are a couple of different stories you can tell. There are a couple of different positions and it's not really clear what's lawful. Surprise, surprise, right? Don't you learn in law school that there's always arguments that you can make? Well, it turns out that that's kind of true in this context as well. So, on the one hand, on the one hand, the executive, the president, and the executive branch of government has almost unlimited power with respect to immigration, national security, and who it lets into the country. There are a few limitations, but not much. And this is rooted in both statutory law and the Constitution. Now, I should be very honest about this and say a lot of these cases come out of very dark and terrible times in our history. Um, so there's a case called Che Chang Che Chan Ping versus United States from 1889 involving the Chinese Exclusion Act. You know, we, we've been worried about foreigners for a long time in the United States. Oh no, the Chinese are coming. Oh no, it's the Muslims. Oh no, it's the Mexicans, right? We, we've been doing this for a long time. So back in the 19th century, oh no, the Chinese. And so Congress passed a thing called the Chinese Exclusion Act, greatly limiting immigration from China. Supreme Court said that's constitutional. That does not violate the civil rights of any of the would-be immigrants because they are, after all, not United States citizens. And the government's power, you know, one of the essential aspects of any government's power is to maintain territorial sovereignty and to maintain its borders and to defend its borders and to say who can cross them, right? And because this is just inherent in the function of a government, the government has to have very broad powers, says the US Supreme Court. Most recently, or more recently, as against a lot of different kinds of challenges, based on a lot of different kinds of constitutional rights, religious discrimination, national origin discrimination, the First Amendment, there's a case called Kleindienst versus Mandel, where the government kept out a Marxist professor. He was gonna come and talk, talk about Marx. We can't have that. Um, and so the government kicked him out. Um, and he challenged this under the guarantee of free speech in the First Amendment. And the Supreme Court said that's fine. Um, Jean versus Nelson involved immigrants from Haiti who were fleeing a you know, terrible, repressive government there and trying to get, come to the United States and the US was keeping them out. They had no claim, said the Supreme Court. They have no right they can assert in US court. Why? Because the government has this almost absolute right to regulate immigration. There's a statute. So in addition to the Constitution, 
There's a statute in the Immigration and Nationality Act, and one section of which is extremely broad. I, I want you to see wow, how broad this is. And by the way, I'm happy to leave these slides. I'll, 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 send, I'll leave a copy of this here for you if anyone's interested in following this. Um, but this statute is quite broad. It said, whenever the president finds that the entry of any alien or any class of aliens into the United States would be detrimental to the interest of the United States, he may suspend the entry of all aliens, blah, blah, blah. But notice this, whenever the president finds, it doesn't say Congress has got to find, it doesn't say the president's got to apply to a court for an order, it's just the president finds. So he wakes up one day and says, I don't want Muslims coming in from these seven countries. We can have them coming in from Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, that's fine, just not from Iran and Syria, who knows why. But as long as the president thinks this, it's okay. He has the authority under the statute to make this finding. More recently, after the September 11th attacks the, on the World Trade Center, Congress and the executive implemented this thing called the National Security Entrance and Registration System, or something, where you have to register your presence in the country if you're from a number of listed countries very similar to Trump's executive order. That was challenged on a number of grounds, upheld every single time by federal courts. Federal courts of appeal didn't make it to the Supreme Court. Federal courts of appeal said this is constitutional, it's within the executive's prerogatives, okay? So we have very, very broad statutory and constitutional authority to exclude anybody. The president can do whatever he wants. On the other hand, right? On the one hand, on the other hand. On the one hand, we have very, very broad power to exclude. On the other hand, there are limits. Now, where they are is a little uncertain, but there are limits, and one of the limits is just blatant religious discrimination, right? So Trump has been, as you may have noticed if you follow the news, um, of two minds about what this is motivated by. When he's speaking to his campaign supporters at these big rallies, he says, keep out the Muslims, and we're gonna have a Muslim ban, and we're gonna build a wall, you know, keep them all out. Um, but then when he's speaking through his attorneys in court, he says, oh no, this isn't a Muslim ban at all. This is a tailored national security motivated order aimed only at specific threats, blah, 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 blah. Why does he do this? Well, because if it was specifically a Muslim ban, then it might actually be unconstitutional. So the president's authority is quite strong but it's not unlimited. And one thing the president can't do is engage in blatant, invidious discrimination. It can't say, we're keeping you out because you're Muslim. We're keeping you out because you're of African descent. We're keeping you out because you're whatever. You can't do that. Or you also can't say, we're only gonna let the Christians in and not any other religions. You can't do that. And there are some cases saying that. Now, here's a really interesting issue, which is pretty underdeveloped, and I think will be the big constitutional issue that has to get worked out in courts. And that's to what extent can a court look behind the facial justification of an order, which says all this stuff about national security and developing procedures for vetting immigrants. To what extent can a court look behind that and look at the president's true motivations? Can a court look into the president's heart Probably not, actually. Um, there's a lot of case law saying as long as there is a facially legitimate bona fide purpose for doing something, a court is not gonna look behind that and try to look into the president's heart. So if on its face, the purpose is national security, allowing the government to tighten up its procedures or whatever, that's on its face legitimate, right? So a court's not gonna look behind that and try to see what's really going on here. There's a Supreme Court case called American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee versus Reno, which says not only should we not be looking at the real reason, but courts aren't in a very good position to do this. How in the world are we gonna find out what's the, the real reason, right? You know, you say it's national security, but actually you just don't like Muslims or you're trying to appeal to your base. How can a court figure that out? It's hard. How can you take evidence to find out what's really in the president's heart? This is a road we don't want to go down, right? But, but, but Trump has been so dishonest and so contemptuous of restrictions on his power that courts are actually starting to go there. Courts are actually starting to look into his heart, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. You have all of these cases saying you can't do that, but we're faced with a president who just can't be trusted. 
And so you're actually seeing courts start to exercise more oversight and actually start to engage in a more searching inquiry than otherwise they might. Um, there's a, a really great national security blog called Lawfare, and they recently had an essay that said, you know, what happens when you can't believe the president's oath of office? So the president comes into office and he takes an oath to uphold the Constitution. Generally, we assume that he means that. And a lot of these doctrines where we defer to the president are based on the assumption that the president really will, in good faith, try to uphold the Constitution. But what if we don't believe him? Wow, right? That's kind of uncharted legal ground, and that's where I think we're going. And th these are some of the legal issues that courts have to work out. Again, I'm less interested in that. I'm not a constitutional law specialist. I'm an ethical theorist. And so what I want to know about is, Given that background, okay, given the two stories we've told, strong executive authority, some limitation, case law supporting both, given those two things, what should a government lawyer do? You're working in the Justice Department, your boss comes to you and says, prepare a memo on the travel ban order. Should we advise the president that it's lawful or not? On this basic question, there are really two families of views, and I'll differentiate them a little bit more. But, but two, two positions that have been taken by scholars and also people who themselves have been former high-level government lawyers, particularly those in the Office of Legal Counsel in the Justice Department, which is a very elite office which provides advice to the president. So one view is, and this is what Acting Attorney General Sally Yates said, government lawyers should seek the best view of the law. That's their job. It's not just to say the president can get away with something or there's an argument that can be made or you, know, you wouldn't be sanctioned in court for making that argument to a judge. Rather, the obligation of government lawyers is to figure out of all these different views that are out there, what's the best? What's the best view of the law? And that's the advice that a government lawyer should provide to the president. Former attorneys in, by and large, democratic administrations have said that this is what the president ought to do. Don Johnson, Randy Moss. Others say, no, 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 no. You don't advise the president on the best view of the law. You advise the president on the lawfulness of a proposed course of action. Notice that subtle difference. Best view, lawfulness, right? You could imagine a bunch of positions that are all arguably lawful. Some of them don't seem like the best view of the law. They might make you go, ugh, uh, I find it repugnant, I find it unjust. Or I find it to be kind of a strained view of the law, but it's nevertheless lawful. So the second view is different because it says, Yes, lawyers have to advise on whether something is lawful. They can't just help the president get away with stuff. But if the distinction between different potentially lawful views of the law is really a policy decision, that should go with the president. Because the president has the democratic mandate. The president was elected for policy reasons. And in a democracy, you worry about decision makers who don't have that sense of legitimacy and accountability to the voters. Who has accountability to the voters? President much more so directly than the Attorney General. The President ran and said, we're going to make America great again, we're going to keep out all the Muslims. People said, yeah, we want you in the, in the White House. He's the guy who's answerable to the people, not a lawyer who says, yeah, I don't think that's the best view of the law. So this is the second position, right? I know you want me to come here, I suspect you want me to come here, and say Trump is a terrible guy, which I do think, um, and lawyers should therefore do what they think is the best for the country. I'm going to take a position somewhere in the middle. I'm going to be a little bit wa waffly and wavery and kind of yeah, ambiguous. You may not like that. But I'm somewhere in between these two views. So just to kind of foreshadow a little bit, where I'm going to wind up is to say there's something very important in this second position, and that is that legitimacy is the most important thing in government lawyer ethics. 
we have to be concerned with having the right connection to the democratic process. It's worrisome when unaccountable, unelected officials make decisions about what's in the public interest for others in a democracy. That's worrisome. But what I want to sign on to up here is that not all views of the law are the same. Now, I'm not going to go quite as far as Sally Yates and say it's the best view of the law. But what I will say is that to, say, to call a position lawful is kind of a big deal. It's, it's more than just saying it's reasonable. It's more than just saying it's something you could assert in court. It's saying this is the right interpretation of the law. This is the, the, what the law really means, as opposed to what the law could be made to mean, or what you could say with a straight face. So my position is actually somewhere in between these two views, and you know, I'm watching the time, don't worry, um, and I'll try to give you a sense for, for what this is. So what I want to do is kind of proceed negatively. I want to start with what it would mean to actually require lawyers to seek the best view of the law, and we'll go through these different versions of this position and kind of decide what you think of them. And I actually, one reason I'm watching the clock is not only I want to be respectful of your time, but I want to hear what you have to say also. I didn't come all this way just to lecture you. Um, I want to learn. I'm in India to learn. And so I want to hear what you have to think too. So I want to set out some variations on the view that a lawyer ought to seek the best view of the law, tell you what's good and bad about them in my opinion, and, and hear back. So maybe you agree, maybe you disagree. All right. So th there are different versions of this idea that a lawyer ought to seek the best view of the law. One is that the lawyer ought to advise a government client consistent with the public interest. The government lawyers have a duty to act in the public interest. A second version is that a lawyer ought to be a wise counselor. And what that ends up meaning is should assist the client in coming up with a well-considered judgment about what the client's own interests are. It's version number two. Version number three is that a lawyer ought to predict what courts will do. That to say something is the best view of the law is essentially to say that a court would uphold the executive order if it's challenged. Finally, we'll consider a legal philosopher who you may or may not have encountered in your classes, Ronald Dworkin. And Ronald Dworkin talks a lot about the obligation of a judge to find the best view of the law. And in fact, I just wrote a little short paper in the Michigan Law Review online about Sally Yates's letter. And I said, you know, to me, someone who's a scholar of legal philosophy, it sounds a lot like Dworkin. I don't know if she was trying to invoke Ronald Dworkin, but it, she sure did for my ears. And so we'll talk a little bit about Ronald Dworkin. Again, where am I at in all of this? I wrote a book um, called Lawyers and Fidelity to Law, where I argued that the most important ethical value underlying the lawyer's role is the political moral value of legitimacy. So again, for me, I'm going to come back to this idea that I always want to be testing these views against the idea of legitimate government decision making. And we'll see which one of these is consistent with that. All right, so we'll go through these four different versions of the best view of the law. Number one, public interest view. And you hear this a lot. If you had a government lawyer come in here and speak, I betcha, they would say something like, the obligation of a government lawyer is always to pursue the common good or the public interest. And what's interesting about this is they often say, we do that in government. We're the good lawyers. Those, those nasty private lawyers at big law firms representing banks and big companies, they don't pursue the public interest. They just pursue the interests of their clients. They're kind of eh, kind of unethical and gross. We, however, government lawyers, we pursue the public interest. I'm a former big firm lawyer myself. I used to represent big companies. And I always say, hey, wait a second. I'm not so sure that I like this implicit acceptance of a vision of ethical practice for private clients that allows anything less than what we would expect for government clients. I want them to be the same. I want a lawyer's advice. And again, this is not in-court representation. This is advising. I want a lawyer's advice when the lawyer says, this is lawful, this is unlawful, to be the same. It, it, it should bear the same kind of relationship to the law and what other values are relevant, justice or morality or whatever. 
for either government or private clients. Now, I understand that there's a constitutional obligation on the part of the president to interpret the law, but there's also an obligation on the part of private citizens to comply with the law. No different, right? If you're Citibank, you have an awful lot of power. In some cases, you have more power than the government. And I don't like the idea that they have somehow a lesser obligation to comply with the law than the government does. And I don't like the idea that a lawyer advising Citibank has some kind of permission as a matter of ethics to just help them get away with stuff. That's okay for big companies, but not for us government lawyers. But you do hear this a fair bit. Government lawyers have a greater obligation to act in the common good or the public interest than their counterparts in private practice. All right. So on all these positions, I'll have sometimes little objections that can be raised. And one of the classic objections that can be raised here is, hang on a second, wait. What it, what's in the public interest? You know, one of the things, this is my first visit to India, um, and so I'm learning a lot. And I you know, have whatever conceptions visitors have uh, upon a first visit to a country. One of the things I just love about India, I think it's just fantastic, is that it's a big, complicated, unruly democracy. You've got all kinds of different religious groups and visions of the public interest and yay Modi, boo Modi, and it's just it's a complicated, you know, and they're, they're, and I don't, I don't approve of violence, but I love the fact that student groups are out marching and protesting, and it's just, it's really cool. You, 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 this is a vibrant democracy. And one of the things that makes a democracy important as a form of government is that it accommodates competing visions of the public interest. You don't all agree. That's why you have elections, right? That's why you have activism and journalism and demonstrations and, and you petition the government and you file lawsuits. You do all of these things within a democracy because we disagree about the public interest. That's the whole point. Right? If we didn't disagree about the public interest, we wouldn't have elections. You could just find a wise elder to do the right thing and follow them. Now, when, when Donald Trump is your president, you sometimes think, that might not be a bad idea. Um, but the, the, the objection to this public interest view is that the content of the public interest is contested in a pluralistic society. The US is a pluralistic society. India is a pluralistic society. We disagree about a lot of stuff. And to say to a lawyer, do what's in the public interest, simply begs the important question, which is what should the lawyer do, right? So this is an objection to the public interest view. Now, a, a variation on this, which is kind of interesting and deep, and I you know, could say more about this in questions if you want, is to link up the public interest version with a classical value of professionalism. And you know, there's a really important 19th century conception of professions as a different kind of institution that is somewhere between individuals and the state. So professions are occupational groups that, that aren't just economic actors, and they're not the state, but they somehow conserve and, and represent important public values. And so people like Durkheim, Talcott Parsons in the early part of the 20th century, Max Weber, said what's important about professions is that they orient their activities around values that are not just economic, right? So, so economic market actors are just trying to maximize profits. And individuals have whatever motives they have. But professionals are all about conserving important public values, civic virtue, if you want to use those terms. And lawyers, of course, are classically a profession claim this title of we're a profession. And, and insofar as we call ourselves a profession and not just another economic actor, we're not just like a business, right? And again, I'm not crazy about this implied denigration of a business. Ooh, businesses are bad. We're not like them. We're, we're, we're good. We're a profession. But to the extent profession means something, it means commitment to some kind of public values or civic virtue. And this is a deep tradition in the American legal profession. I don't know if this has so much resonance in India, but Americans love to quote Tocqueville, who came to visit the US in the early part of the 19th century, and called the legal profession the American aristocracy. And he really meant that. He was being literal about that. He said it's like the British aristocracy, in that it's anti-democratic. So I just gave this argument for why the public interest view is anti-democratic. Tocqueville would say, yeah, 
That's right. Um, you don't necessarily want decision making to be blown about by the winds of public opinion. You don't want government policy to be determined by some guy going into a stadium and saying, yeah, build a wall. And all the people in the stadium go, yeah, build a wall, lock her up. You know, that's a pretty bad way to make policy. You, you, you want to have policy made by people who are somewhat detached from that. And we have a lot of anti-democratic features in our constitution because our constitutional drafters were, were a little bit nervous about, about mob rule. They weren't so crazy about what they called tyranny of the majority. So there's a really interesting tension in American constitutional thought between democratic legitimacy, which is kind of where I'm landing, and some anti-democratic tendencies. You know, we have anti-democratic institutions. We have an unrepresentative upper house of Congress. We have a Supreme Court that can invalidate legislation. It's true in India as well. So there's a tension between democratic and anti-democratic institutions that may be right, that that tension may be important. And, and locating the legal profession within that tension is important to do as well. So I understand where this public interest view comes from. I, I criticize it, but I understand the attraction of it, especially given this professional theory in, in Tocqueville. Okay, so the second version of the public interest view is this wise counselor idea. And lawyers say this sort of thing all the time too, when they want to feel good about themselves. Um, lawyers say things like this. About half of the practice of a decent lawyer consists in telling their clients that they're damn fools and should stop. So, you know, you say to your clients, look, I know you can do that, you can get away with it, but it's a bad idea, right? And the, this is, the, I think, the only citation to American rules of professional conduct that I have, model rule 2.1, which says, in giving legal advice, a lawyer may refer not only to law, but also to other considerations such as moral, economic, social, and political factors that may be relevant to the client situation. So lawyers giving legal advice aren't limited to just giving you technical legal advice. There's nothing wrong with saying to your client, this is a bad idea. So Sally Yates could have said to the president, Mr. President, you have the lawful authority to implement this executive order. However, from the point of view of public opinion, international relations, human rights, it's an extremely bad idea. You, you shouldn't do it even though you have the authority to do that. That's fine, all right? And I, no one doubts that. No one doubts that a lawyer can say to the client, this is a bad idea. Now, a lawyer is not under this version of the position permitted to say, and therefore you can't do this. The lawyer just says, you can do this, but it's a bad idea. And the idea here, the emphasis is on really focusing on the client's own well-considered deliberative judgments about what's in his or her own best interests. So a lawyer can assist the client in deliberation. A lawyer is not required to simply accept at face value what the client says about its best interests. A client might say, I want to build a wall, I want to implement a Muslim ban. And a lawyer could say, is that really in your long run best interests? That, that's okay. Um, but again, that doesn't justify telling the client it's impermissible to do something. It's just assisting the client in coming up with a judgment about its own self-interest. All right. Now we're getting into some jurisprudence, and this is my own area of interest. I don't know. I'm um, to ask you guys a question. How many of you have read H.L.A. Hart and Ronald Dworkin and Lon Fuller and some of the classics of Anglo, oh, there we go, okay, okay, this is good, this won't, okay, this won't be too boring, then I sort of wondered if this is going to be something you don't really care about. Um, all right, so another version of this idea that a lawyer ought to seek the best view of the law is that a lawyer should advise the client about the position that is most likely to be sustained if challenged in court. So this is the idea of law as prediction. This is Hart in chapter three in the concept of law if you've read this recently. Now, there are a bunch of problems with this. I don't like this idea that the best view of the law is nothing more than a prediction of what courts will do. This is a position often associated with what's called American legal realism in the 1930s, which tried to sort of demystify the idea of law. It's kind of the same sort of family as logical positivism in the 1930s. The idea that we don't like these mysterious metaphysical ideas of, of Grundnormen or whatever, like Kelson would say. We, that's kind of a mysterious way to think about the law. We, we rather want to demystify this concept of law by making it empirical. 
And how do you make something empirical? You talk in terms of behavioral regularities. So the law is nothing more than what officials will do if they're given a case to decide, right? This is Jerome Frank, Carl Llewellyn. A lot of American legal realists in the 1930s said this kind of thing. And one might think that that's all the best view of the law is. It's not, and, and what all lawyers do, the, the skill of lawyers, the, the training of lawyers, is in making accurate predictions about what officials will do. So th the useful thing you can provide to your client is information about how a judge will decide a case. And, and that's pretty valuable. That's what your clients pay you for, but nothing else. Now there are some problems with that. One problem is that certainly a government actor, and I would argue also a private actor, has an obligation to apply the law to themselves. So our president takes an oath to uphold the Constitution, to take care that the Constitution be faithfully executed. So the president has his own independent constitutional obligation to interpret the law. Now, that's delegated to a bunch of lawyers. Donald Trump couldn't interpret the newspaper, let alone the law. So he delegates to a bunch of lawyers the obligation to advise him on compliance with the law, but he's got to comply with the law, not just do whatever he can get away with. Problem number two is a more pragmatic version of this argument, which is that there are an awful lot of government decisions that never get challenged in court. So if you think that the law is nothing more than a prediction of what a court will do, how do you account for the decisions that government actors make that never get challenged? Either they're done in secret, uh, or there are some jurisdictional impediments to challenging them, standing, mootness, ripeness, whatever. Um, and so as a practical matter, there will never be a court resolution of this. How do, you, how do you square the predictive theory of law with the practical reality that a lot of decisions never wind up in court? Problem number three, this is the HLA Hart thing, um, and that is you can't really equate law with predictions of what others will do because, conceptually, says Hart, it is a truth about the law that its function is to guide action. That's what the law does, that's what it is. If you ask what is the law, it is guides to action. It alters practical reasoning in a way, to kind of more, use a more Joseph Raz way of thinking about it. The whole point of law is that it creates reasons for action. And a reason, for someone is not a prediction about what somebody else will do, it's what one himself or herself has reason to do. And so if you understand the function of law as guiding action, it's just a conceptual mistake to reduce the law to predictions. Now there's a more sophisticated version of this, so this is kind of the simple version of the predictive view. A somewhat more sophisticated version is when we're talking about predictions, we're really just engaging in a manner of speaking. This is really just a heuristic. We really don't mean that the law is nothing other than a prediction. Rather, talking in terms of predictions gives us a way of expressing to a client why what they want to do is unlawful. So you say to your client, Mr. President, a court would take this apart in 15 different ways. You're not saying that the only thing the law is is a prediction, but you're, you're better expressing the reasons for your conclusion that something is not lawful. So let's take the, the executive order here in question. Let's suppose that Sally Yates went to President Trump and that he was motivated to listen to her, which I don't think he was. And she said, I don't think this is lawful, Mr. President. And he goes, what are you talking about? And she says, well, if this were challenged in court, a court would say a number of different things. Um, it's ludicrously overbroad. It includes lawful permanent residents who have been living in the United States for 10 years, and you're gonna kick them out on national security reasons. That's crazy. It's under-inclusive. It doesn't include countries that are a much more plausible security threat, like Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Um, it's, it's, it's badly constructed. It doesn't seem to fit very well with this purported national security justification. It was rushed through the drafting process. We didn't get the judgment of other agencies. And for those reasons, Mr. President, it's likely to be struck down by a court of challenge. What, what she's really saying there is it's not lawful. That, that my judgment as a lawyer is that it's not lawful, but she's pitching it in terms of prediction. I can live with that if it's just a manner of speaking. I just wanna make sure that we don't reduce the concept of law to nothing other than prediction in this rush to be all empirical about it. I, I, wanna, I wanna make sure that the law 
the, conceptually, the law remains important as a guide to action. All right. And the fourth version of this best view of the law thing is Dworkin. And Ronald Dworkin says, how do we know when something is legitimate as a conclusion of law? So when you say, yes, Mr. President, you may do this. No, Mr. President, you may not do that. That's a conclusion of law, a proposition about law. How do we know that's, that's correct? How do you cash out the meaning of that? How do you give truth conditions for a proposition of law? Dworkin says what you do is you show that the proposition of law is the best constructive interpretation of the community's political practices from the standpoint of political morality. Whoa! I don't know how long it's been since you've read Dworkin, but, but stop and think about that for a minute. That's pretty radical. That's a statement that when you say something is lawful, you are stating a moral proposition. You are stating that this is the best interpretation of the community's political morality. Not, it was passed by parliament, uh, it has the right form, it was put in a statute book or whatever. No, it is the best constructive interpretation of our community, however diverse and complicated and internally contradictory it is, it's the best constructive interpretation of the community's political morality. Only then do you get to say something is lawful. That's Dworkin. So you see where, wow. So you see where Sally Yates is coming from, right? You see that when she comes back to President Trump and says, Mr. President, we can't do this. It's not the best view of the law. What she's saying is, this is a really crummy interpretation of our community's political morality. We're better than this. You know, we don't exclude people on the basis of nationality. We don't exclude people on the basis of religion. That's not who we are as a people. And I think a lot of the people who really objected strongly to the executive order, the travel ban order, were saying that as, as a political moral matter. They were saying, this is not who we are as a nation. We're better than this. And but what would be there is Dworkin's political moral view that in order for something to be the law, it has to best express our community's moral principles. So I think that's the best way of giving sense to the, the Yates letter. But here's the problem with that. I don't know, again, how much of Dworkin y'all have read, or if you read Law's Empire, but what makes something the best view on Dworkin's account is that you could imagine it being written by a single author, as it were. You know, Judge Hercules, right? So Judge Hercules has all of the time in the world and he's you know, strong and mighty and smart. And, uh, and, and, and he can actually get in there and read all of the case law and the statutes and the constitutional provisions and consider the community's political morality. And he can knit this whole complicated, unruly, pluralistic thing into one voice, right? I think you can see where I'm going with this because I just got done saying that I think India is fantastic because it's pluralistic and, and noisy and complicated and, 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 and I think the same is true of the US at its best actually, that it's pluralistic and diverse and, and we disagree and it's, it, that's kind of the cool thing about it. Dworkin, Dworkin seems not to like that so much. Dworkin seems to want to reduce it all to one, to the best view of the law, right? That's where Yates is coming from, right? The, the, the best constructive interpretation of our political practices. And Dwork, I mean, Dworkin's got a very, very strong thesis in Law's Empire. He says, only then is something law. Um, until something is the best constructive interpretation of our community's moral practices, only then is it law. So that's what I think Yates was really going for. I, I, I think the reason that this letter will be read for generations is that she was trying to, she was being a Dworkinian. She was trying to be like Ronald Dworkin in the Justice Department. This is not who we are as a people. This is not our best view of the law. So it can't be the law. So what Dworkin is doing, technically, a little more technically as a matter of jurisprudence, is running together a couple of different things that are normally separate. People like Raz are very careful to separate this stuff. 
Dworkin sort of runs them together. Dworkin says, on the one hand, what does it mean for something to be law, right? You know, legal positivists talk about the sources thesis or whatever. Dworkin wants to combine that with when something is law with the further more normative question of when law rightfully creates obligations, when law has authority, as Raz would say. He wants to run those two things together, and he wants to say that in order for law to rightfully obligate, it has to be the best constructive account of our community's practices, moral practices, right? So in this case, what Yates is saying is, this is just not law. It's not law because it's not the best constructive account of our community's moral practices. We can do better than this. We are better than this. I think that's what Sally Yates was saying. I think she was saying, we are better than this. Therefore, she said, this is not law. Now look, I agree with her that we can do better than this. I agree that this is not our best face as the American people. We don't look so good in the world doing this. Right? So I, I agree with her that we can do better than this. I just don't agree with the follow-on conclusion, which is, therefore, this is not law. This is where I part company with Dworkin. So I think it's possible to say of a legal judgment, this makes us look lousy. Um, th this is not who we are as a people in the best sense, but it's still lawful. Governments do crummy things all the time. We have a long history of it. Actually, in the immigration area, we have a whole bunch of examples of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, we have a lot of examples of not being our best, but nevertheless acting lawfully. So I want to I want to keep space between those things. You know, where I'm at is to say, I'm kind of against Hercules. You know, I don't think the task of a judge is Herculean. I don't think it is to unify all of this diverse, unruly stuff into one master narrative and to say this is the community's narrative of who we are as a people and it's the best constructive interpretation of our political morality and only those things that fit within that story are law. I, I, I think it's wildly overambitious for one thing, but I also think it denies the essential pluralism that makes democracies what they are. You know, I, there's a romanticism to Dworkin that I kind of admire, and this idea that we're all one people and we all subscribe to one set of foundational values. But I, I think what's cool about democracy is just that we're all a whole bunch of different kinds of people. And we're held together by allegiance to a, a, a somewhat thinner set of values, but just because they're thin doesn't mean they're not important. You know, they're thin in the sense that they're, they're values of tolerance and mutual respect and things like that, but they're still very important. We don't have to agree on all particulars. We don't have to agree on deeper substantive value commitments as long as we agree to treat one another with respect and to act faithfully to a system of laws that expresses a view that we're all citizens, that we're both in this together, that you and I may disagree, but we're all part of a common culture. And we don't have to agree on everything to care about maintaining that framework of cooperation. And I think Dworkin makes it hard to do that by, by instructing judges and lawyers that they're always meant to be searching for the best view and the, the right answer. You know, Dworkin famously talks about right answers. I just think it's a misguided quest. And I don't want to load all that up into the function of a judge, which is what Dworkin mostly talks about, or this kind of quasi-judicial function of a government legal advisor. Right, so go, go back to all the stuff I was talking about before. I said this isn't about litigation. This isn't about a position you could advance in court. This is about when you are giving advice. Mr. President, you can do this or you can't do this. You're acting in a kind of quasi-judicial capacity. You're saying this is what the law permits or requires. And when you're doing that, you are acting as a lawgiver. You're speaking in the voice of the law. And I just think that Dworkin is too keen to put this all into one box and to therefore deny the pluralism and diversity that makes our country and your country as well great. Um, and so that's the part that I, that's where I kind of part company with, with Sally Yates. And so I want to, I want to put forward a vision of kind of non-Herculean lawyering. So, you know, Dworkin's all about Hercules, the ideal judge, and you know, Hercules is great. But I want to be a little bit more modest in what I think a good lawyer should do. And a non-Herculean lawyer is really a, a, an agent of a client or a servant of a client. And I mean that in a good way. 
I want to say that what our function should be understood as is assisting the client in carrying out the client's lawful projects. We're, we're, we're just agents, and that's not a bad thing. I think sometimes lawyers want to feel like Hercules because we want to feel important. We want to feel like we are guardians in some platonic sense. But we're really just servants, but not in a bad way. We, we provide valuable expertise, which is both technical and ethical to our clients, but we ultimately serve our clients. We're not the final decision makers. There's a moral division of labor between the lawyer and the client. And that's true in the government lawyering context as well. The, the, and, and, and why is there a division of labor? This is the important part when it comes to government lawyers. The reason there's this moral division of labor between setting the objectives of the representation and, and providing the means by which they're carried out is it's only the client that has democratic legitimacy. It's only the client's position that has been subjected to the electoral process, however imperfect that is, and validated as our community's moral position. The lawyer doesn't have that democratic mandate. The lawyer's decisions potentially are illegitimate in ways that the governments are not. Look, I, I think Trump is wrong about absolutely everything, but I will admit that under our weird, arcane system of counting votes, he won fair and square. You know, I don't think there was any kind of the fix was in or anything like that. I, th I think he legitimately got the majority of the electoral votes, which are allocated by our states in some bizarre process. He won. And as a consequence, that's the final decision as between these different visions of what the government should be doing that were contested in the last election. We had the Trump vision and the Clinton vision. The Trump vision won. You know what? I, I lost on that. My, my side lost. But we lost fair and square. There are a lot of imperfections in our democracy. There are a lot of reasons that to, to think that it, you know, it's corrupt in local and pervasive ways. But it's the best we can do, and it's better than the alternative of having people deciding for themselves what's in the best interest of the country. And so you know what? The job of a lawyer is to implement that vision. And that's true of government lawyers as well. They don't get an independent mandate to act on behalf of what they take to be in the public interest. That's the question that got settled by the election. You know what? I lost on that. That's a bummer, but it's fair. Um, but I do think that there is something important to what lawyers provide over and above this kind of electoral legitimacy. And that is that lawyers enforce this key difference. And I know it's hard to see, but if I blew up only one slide in this presentation, I'm going to end. I know everyone's checking their watch. I'm gonna, if I could blow up only one slide, it would be this. And that is when a lawyer says her obligation is to advise on the law, there's a difference between what the law permits and what someone can get away with. You know, what is something that just, you know, a position you could advance in court or something you could get away with if you obscure it enough or, you know, something that is just the exercise of raw power that's different from what the law really permits. And there's actually a lot going on in what the law really permits. It's an important constructive interpretive process which is not reducible to an argument we can make in court without getting sanctioned by a judge. And so there is a kind of middle ground here between lawyers pursuing the public interest and lawyers just enabling clients to get away with whatever they want to do. And that is bringing their clients into compliance with the law. And the final important thing to understand about this is that lawyers are providing crucial pushback against the Trump administration. Not about values. I mean, they, they are doing that too. Uh, th there are a lot of other ways of challenging Trump's white nationalist vision of American political morality, which is awful. There are a lot of institutions doing that. But what lawyers are doing is reinforcing this idea that government decisions have to be legitimate. And that means being accountable in particular ways. It's not just doing whatever you can get away with. And one of the things to be careful of in a sort of autocratic, tending administration like ours is this tendency to, to delegitimize any checking institution, 
any institution that seeks to enforce accountability as being merely partisan. And you see this in Trump's speeches over and over and over again. You know, it's the, the, the press is out to get me. They're in the tank for the Democrats. They're all biased for Hillary Clinton. Uh, the courts are all, you know, this judge is a Mexican or whatever. It's all this attempt to delegitimize the opposition. And that's where my vision of lawyering actually has some bite, which is to say, no, no, no. We are enforcing accountability. And accountability is not partisan. In order for it not to be partisan, it has to be based on the law. It has to be based on not just Sally Yates disagrees with Trump, but he's wrong about the law. And so that's where I think there is some bite to this normative vision that I'm putting forward. It's not the same thing as the public interest, but the best view of the law does mean something. All right. I hope I left enough time for questions. I really do want to hear what y'all think. I really do want to have some Q&A time. Uh, and thank you very much for having me out to talk about this stuff. How, what's the norm here? Do I just kind of call on people? Is there a queue? How does this work? So we can do it in different ways, I guess. So one way would be first of all to thank you for your, uh, your very thought-provoking uh, lecture on various ways to think about lawyers' role in, within the government and, of course, then we are two words back. Also, I thought, you know, maybe you could just, like, think about, have some thoughts on how do you think the questions arise in the context that we are in. Hmm. Yeah, no, no, that, that, that's great. So thank you for getting into the jurisprudence and, and my position and everything. I'm, I'm honored. Um, so the, the standard conception of legal ethics is this position that, 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 that what a lawyer should do is be partisan, that is be loyal to the client, and seek to advance the client's position, be neutral, that is not sort of sit in moral judgment of the client's position, and, and be non-accountable in the sense that others should not criticize the lawyer for helping the client do a morally lousy thing as long as it's lawful. That's the standard conception. So, what, so where I come into this whole debate, so I, I wrote that book and my, my friend Tim Dare at the University of Auckland wrote a similar book too. We, we both developed them independently and they came out at the same time. And they're kind of this modified standard conception. So the, the original standard conception is that what a lawyer should do is pursue the client's interests as long as it's within the law, and by within the law that means you're not going to get punished in some way. You're not going to get sanctioned by a court or, or criminally punished or held civilly liable. What I say and what Tim says, and people who work on this sort of modified standard conception, is that what you are meant to do as a client, the partisanship part, is not pursue your client's interests, but pursue your client's legal, I call them entitlements. Tim calls them legal rights. But, but whatever the client, whatever, whatever rights and responsibilities are allocated to citizens by the law, that's what, a client, that's what a lawyer should help people pursue. So it's not just, I mean, interests has this flavor of whatever you can get away with. And 
I really want to draw, I say this more than Tim, I think, I want to draw a strong distinction between law and power. And legitimate power is lawful power, but the standard conception has a hard time making that distinction. The true standard conception is, if it's in your client's interest and the client's not going to be punished, then the lawyer should pursue that, which sounds to me more like power than, than right. So I'm interested in this distinction between rightful power and naked power. Um, and so I, I think, you know, there, there are lots of cases in which the unmodified standard conception and the, the dare Wendell standard conception reach different results. This may not be one um, because there is so much pluralism in the law. You've got these two stories and I think they're both really and truly deeply rooted in the law. I don't think one of them is deviant or a minority view. I think you really do have strong executive power over immigration and national security, for sure. You also have prohibition on discrimination on the basis of religion and nationality and expression and things like that. Those are both authentically visions of American public law. And, and so if, if they both kind of coexist alongside one another, then the client has the entitlement, the right, to do either. And so, you know, in that case, my position in Tim's looks like the classical standard conception. But there are other cases in which a client may be able to get away with something, but on the right view of the law and the best interpretation of the law, that's not what the law permits. And that's a case where a modified standard conception lawyer would say, no, 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 you can't do that. So that, that's where I'm at. But I mean, I, I'm very, I'm very much opposed to Bill Simon, David Luban, people who say that what the lawyers should do is serve as a custodian of the public interest or tell the client that morally speaking the client can't do this. That's, that's, I don't agree with that. But that's a great question. Yeah, no, that's, so you're the, you're the modern day Tocqueville, so, so, so good on you, right? So the idea that, um, that lawyers are an American aristocracy, he meant that as a good thing. It wasn't a criticism for him. He, he was saying that lawyers are custodians of, of public values. So when I say lawyers are, are, are anti-Herculean, what, what I mean by that is that while, so how, how do I want to put this? The, the pluralism that I'm talking about here is not just in kind of views among members of the public about what the president ought to do. You have some people, build a wall, rah, some people saying, we're better than this. But to be a Herculean interpreter is not to take just that, that's the community's political morality as expressed in various ways, but then to try to give an account of what Dworkin calls past political practices, meaning legislation, the Constitution, case law. And the trouble is, what Hercules has to do is reconcile two parallel strands, two parallel narratives into one. And so it sounds like you know Dworkin, so in Law's Empire, he has this image of a, of a chain novel. So you have the, the, you know, different authors write chapters in a, in a narrative, in a story. And every succeeding author has to somehow make sense of what has come before and tell the, st keep 
the story going in a way that's faithful to what has happened in the past, but in a way that kind of shows what happened in the past in its best light, makes the story interesting, right? So what a judge is required to do is to somehow reconcile these two competing narratives into one. But what happens if they are just authentically two competing narratives? What happens if our co constitutional and legal tradition, I'm not just talking about the 2016 electoral campaign and what people were saying in debates and rallies. I mean what's deeply rooted in our constitutional tradition going back to the 19th century. What if there are really two visions? What if there really are two different Americas there, right? Make America great again. Okay, which one of these things is America? Uh, is it a strong, vigorous executive who can act to protect American lives and safety, right? To protect the public interest and to protect public safety, national security, uh, maintain territorial sovereignty. That's what an executive does after all. You know, that's one vision. Or is the real America, the real vision, this one which is tolerant and inclusive and diverse and acknowledges our foundations as an immigrant nation, accepting of others, right? That's got a lot of expression, not just in political rhetoric in the campaign, but also constitutional tradition and the structure of our constitution, which has, as you say, anti-democratic elements, right? We have a Supreme Court which is empowered to strike down legislation as being inconsistent with the constitution. We have constitutional rights of free expression and free press and religious freedom and all that. That's really part of our tradition too. These things are both part of our tradition. Right? So, I mean, you, you raise a very, very good question. I'm not saying that a lawyer should not look to our constitutional values and traditions and is merely supposed to look at the results of the election and go, okay, 51% of voters voted for Trump. That means Trump can do whatever he wants. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is the alternative is somehow to try to reconcile these two parallel stories into one and say there is one narrative about our constitutional tradition, and only one, and if the president tries to act in other ways, it will be unlawful. That strikes me as greatly inflating the power of lawyers to say that as between these two competing traditions, only one of them is the authentically valid American political moral tradition. So, I mean, you, you raise a really good point, and it's, it's important to say I'm not I'm not saying that the temporary results of an electoral majority represent the only source of legitimacy. They also have to be consistent with constitutional values. But there may be competing conceptions of what constitutional values are. So I mean, th th that's, that's a great question. Yes? Hi. Um, thank you again for my talk. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, the, the Supreme Court on the voter ID thing, I think actually went the other way and said that they're, they're within, within states' constitutional power. So there's a thing called the Voting Rights Act. It's actually not constitutional, but it's a federal legislation. Um, and there's a, there was a requirement that states that traditionally had engaged in discrimination had to get kind of pre-authorization for various ID requirements. And the Supreme Court struck that down a couple years ago and said, we're going to eliminate this pre-clearance requirement. We're going to trust states to do the right thing. Guess what? They didn't. Um, they went back to all these horrible discriminatory practices. And you know, I, this may come back up to the Supreme Court again. Um, but you, know, you raise a really important point about what is the administration's position on all this. So one of the things that I think recent 
American public law scholarship is trying to do is to orient the conversation away from courts and the Supreme Court and more to the elected branches and more to the president's obligation to faithfully interpret the Constitution and also legislative constitutionalism, you know, Congress's obligation to be faithful to the Constitution. And so there's a recognition now, I think, you know, in part coming out of the civil rights movement in the 60s, American progressives became very enamored of the Supreme Court um, as this kind of guardian of our best vision of ourselves. And there's an increasingly a recognition, though, that we need to focus also on the elected branches, and particularly the executive, and ensure that their actions are consistent with the Constitution. But there's an awful lot of latitude for executive branch actors to define different visions of the best view of the law, right? So under a Trump administration, there's gonna be a very different view of the Voting Rights Act. And of course, any of these cases have to be enforced by the Justice Department. So there's a Justice Department Office of Civil Rights, and they're the one who bring these cases, and prosecutors traditionally have a great deal of discretion in determining what cases to bring, what litigation strategies to pursue. And under Attorney General Jefferson Beauregard Sessions from the great state of Alabama, guess what? I don't think a lot of restrictions on voting, which are targeted at minority communities, are going to pop up on his radar screen in the same way they would have under Attorney General Eric Holder or Loretta Lynch under Obama. So there, there, there's a, a great deal of discretion on the part of executive branch actors to decide which of these competing constitutional visions to pursue. Now, if there really are competing constitutional visions, I think that's okay. Um, I disagree with virtually everything Attorney General Sessions does, but if there really is a competing conception of constitutional values that he's pursuing, okay. Um, but there, there, you know, there may not be. So I think a lot depends on the specific statute. You know, um, did I answer that? You look unsatisfied. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's an inconsistency in something that may be legal at this point, but doesn't include the ethics part of it. No, that's a good question, and, and that's hard, right? So, you know, ethics normally is about moral agency and living a, you know, a good life. And one of, the, one of the strongest arguments against this modified standard conception bit is that it really gives some priority to the obligations of a role. So, you know, the, the kind of the framing question of legal ethics is always thought to be role differentiated morality. So you may have obligations in a professional role to do something that an ordinarily good and decent person wouldn't do. And that's kind of the central framing problem. And so what, what you know, Tim and I and others who have defended this modified standard conception have done is just really taken a stand for role differentiated morality. And said, in most cases, you have to follow the obligations of your role, even if an ordinarily good and decent person would find something problematic about doing that. But the question you raise is the right one. What effect does that have on one's moral agency, on one's personal integrity? How do you sleep well at night when, when you're doing something like this? And the answer has to be that, I think, that you believe, you sort of widen out the perspective a little bit, that, that you believe that the institution in general is justified in doing good things in a pluralistic society, in, in contributing to the rule of law and the stabilizing effect of the law in a complicated pluralistic society where we disagree about all sorts of things. And that occasionally on a case-by-case -case basis, you may feel like you're involved in something kind of icky and unjust. But, but more holistically considered, you're doing something valuable in a complex pluralistic society. So where I, one of the many things I disagree with Bill Simon on is that he wants lawyers to make these evaluative decisions case by case. He wants a lawyer to say, in this case, justice requires X. In this case, it requires this. I think that the decision is more kind of wholesale rather than retail. It's you've opted into this role, and it may involve you in doing something that you feel some discomfort in. 
Um, but unless it's really grossly unjust, you just kind of have to do that. And one of the requirements for being a lawyer, especially a government lawyer, may be a certain amount of toleration for that discomfort. Um, and it's hard. It's, it's, it's a hard aspect of the job. And certainly if the injustice becomes sufficiently severe, you can and should do something about it. But in the ordinary case, that's just a feature of, of your professional role.